Hello, and welcome aboard to this episode of the We Are Reading One Piece podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to following the entire story of One Piece from beginning to end, as we focus on one volume each episode. We keep the discussion spoiler free for new fans of the series, so this is the perfect place to follow along, whether you're new to the series or just want to revisit the world of One Piece with us. This week, we will be covering volume 31, We'll Be Here, which covers chapters 286 through 295. My name is Joel, and I'll be your host. And joining me today, we have Sean. This is Sean. And we have Evan. Hello, hello. <laughs> yeah, so right now we are getting towards the end of Skypea. Uh, so where we left off, uh, after learning of Henry's plans to destroy Skypea, Konos warned the citizens of Angel Island, so they began to evacuate. Henry launched the Ark Maxim with Nami at his side. Luffy managed to finally escape from the stomach of the ruler of the sky and caught up to Enru. Enru was shocked to learn that Luffy is immune to his lightning powers, so he resorted to physical combat. He formed a giant ball around Luffy's arm and knocked him off the Ark Maxim. Usopp and Sanji had recovered and also managed to get aboard the Ark. They rescued Nami and evacuated, but not before Sanji also sabotaged the ship. Luffy begins his climb back up to Enru to save Nami, not realizing that she is now off the ship as well. Enru has begun to launch lightning attacks across Skypea, setting the island's destruction in motion. So, yeah, Enru does not have good plans for Skypea. He is set on its destruction. And Luffy is probably the only one that can stop him. Probably. But before we continue on with that, we get the next part of the cover story. Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard, Volume 13. Heard a disrespectful comment about Whitebeard. Uh-oh. <laughs> Ace can't help himself as he knocks out one of the Marines who is making rude remarks about his captain. That's not going to go well. <laughs> it's a little unusual for a Marine. <laughs> yeah, how dare you say something bad about the great pirate. <laughs> Yeah, so it shows how committed Ace is to, uh, to his captain. All right, but let's move on to chapter 286, The Chandoran Demon. As the citizens of Skypea flee from Heaven's Gate in a panic, Amazon doesn't seem to be aware of the severity of their situation, as she tries to collect their exit fees. And those lightning bolts continue to strike the entire island at random. The Strats try to avoid the lightning and must get to their ship, but Luffy has already left to go after Enru. Nami tells the others to get to the ship and she'll go after Luffy with a waiver. Wiper looks on at the destruction in disbelief, as he thinks back on the story the chief told him about his ancestor Kalgura. The reason it was so important to take back their homeland was for his dear friend. 400 years ago, Kalgura had met Mont Blanc Noland. The, Shind the Shandorans of the past did not welcome visitors to Jaya. The great warrior Kalgura made this clear as he single-handedly destroyed a visiting ship. Elsewhere in the Grand Line, Admiral Mont Blanc Nolan led an expedition. As it began to run out of food, Nolan was able to dive into the rough seas and land a big catch. Okay, so we kick off a flashback sequence here. So now we're getting the history of their ancestors and what happened previously uh, 400 years ago uh, in Jaya and with the Shandoran. So we're going to get some of that story here. So, yeah, um, does anybody have any thoughts on this chapter they want to start off with? Before I even opened this book, I was looking at the, if you look at, like, the page edges, you can tell there's going to be a massive flashback because it's all, <laughs> they have the black background, so you can, like, see yep. it on the <laughs> side of the book. I was like, oh, boy, getting some backstory. Here we go. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> But we get an introduction to two characters we've already heard about in Noland and Kalgara, who look awesome. I feel like they're both have really cool character design. Yeah. Mr. Ch Chestnut himself. <laughs> you can see the resemblance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hard to miss. I love the silhouette of Kalgara in the page right after the ball hits the, 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 the ship, where he's just like a demon werewolfy thing and like a silhouette mm -hmm. silhouette almost it's just really cool looking oh yeah that, that was pretty cool yeah shandoran demon yeah i guess so 
Yeah, and he like destroys the ship using like a ball and chain. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just swing this giant, massive like iron ball and like smashes this ship. He kills a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Living up to the name. Yeah. Foreshadowing, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> How do I also love when you get Amazon again. Right at the yeah. first page for Sully. <laughs> yes. Miss oh, Amazon's yeah. back. Hold it right there. You're actually feisty team. as ever. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Amazon, you need to hurry and run away too. <laughs> she just keeps Not before taking, I get your exit. <laughs> she keeps taking a bunch of photos. <laughs> hey, don't worry, I got you all. I'm not missing anybody. I'm not missing anybody. I'll get you. <laughs> Uh, we al- we also get mention of um, the Levmill Kingdom. How do I don't I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't yeah, know. um, I don't know how to pronounce it either. Actually, Nolan's Kingdom or wherever Nolan comes from. Yeah, L V N E E L. Yeah. Levmill. Levmill. No idea. Yeah, Le- Levmill. North North Blue. Yeah, so he's from North Blue. Yep. Yeah, love Neil. He's also a total badass. Like, yeah. I wasn't expecting him to be so <laughs> insanely strong. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, when I said big catch, like, he gets, like, something that's, like, as big as, big as a ship. <laughs> like, he is he is basically cosplaying Zoro at the end. Like, I, suppose, <laughs> I suppose, in a way, Zoro is yeah. cosplaying him. <laughs> Considering he was yeah. the first to do it, so <laughs> four hundred years earlier. But I, I get the sense that this is a new thing to yeah. This is very like his crew are not familiar with him because they are shocked that he jumps in, and even more shocked that he comes back like just the giant fish. So like, I guess he doesn't show this part of him off that often, or he didn't need to. That's fair. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think I think it's probably because he's like an explorer, not he's not like a captain or anything. So I feel like he probably has different crews because he gets a different crew later on in this in this volume, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that so, later. But yeah. Um, yeah, it could be a case too where like they've done more like stuff like locally to their area first. And because of their expertise, they're going out. But like he also has background and, um, you know, naval activities. So, I mean, he is an admiral, so. Uh, he at least Actually. has experience to some degree. Mm. Clearly. Clearly. He's good at fishing. But yeah, we get um like a little scene. So Wiper is having like um it's kinda like uh it's kinda Wiper's flashback here just because like he's thinking back on um the story that the, the chief had told him. So we had seen the last volume. The chief was trying to they we saw like the start that he was explaining that there was some other reason why Calgara wanted to reclaim their land. So now we're kind of getting like we're filling the blanks there. So um, yeah, we didn't get the full picture last time. So now we're we're getting the rest of that story that kind of got cut off last time. So this is something that Wiper is aware of. Mm. Yeah. So uh, anything else on this one? It's good table setting of what's the, the how this flashbacks to come. These two characters that are similar in their strength, but also probably different in their like more general personality. Like, Calgar is way more manic and crazy, obviously. <laughs> Whereas Noland is very, very still looks like he has a lot of etiquette and stuff, but mm. similarly strong. Yeah, definitely different backgrounds with these two characters. Oh so, yeah. All right, uh, let's get Sean's summary for the next chapter. Next chapter. That is 287 Kami Killing. We continue our flashback of Admiral, Admiral Mont Blanc Noland aboard his ship as it is suddenly caught in a terrible storm. Everyone on the crew is in a full tilt panic, aside from Noland, who seems entirely unconcerned with the weather. Somehow, in the tumult of the storm, the Admiral claims to hear the sound of a bell. Cutting back to the Isle of Jaya, we see the last moments of High Priest Pantori of the Shandians, who claims on his deathbed that the only way to save their land from a curse that will kill them all and kill kill them and all their crops is to sacrifice the most beautiful woman on the island to their sun god. The woman in question, question, Muse, seems totally cool with this idea. (laughs) She is happy to be sacrificed there if there, she is happy to be sacrificed if there is, and I quote, a chance that it will help. Her mother, 
is not as sold on this idea, to put it lightly. But cutting back to Pantori, the high priest breathes his last. The Shandians surrounding him bemoan the recent deaths on the island, over a hundred lost. As they speak, one of them notices a dark mark on the arm of another, Seto, who panics upon seeing it and runs screaming from the village. The others, the others tell his friend not to follow Seto, as, as once the mark of the evil spirit appears, there is no saving someone. Seto tries to remove the mark from his skin regardless, specifically by scraping at the skin with a rock, I've heard of exfoliating before, but this seems extreme. Regardless, Seto suddenly spots Great Warrior Kalgara returning from his hunt. Seto tearfully expresses how he looked up to Kalgara and wanted to re- wanted to follow in his footsteps. He tells him he does not wish to die in this way. We return to the perspective of Noland and his men, who have made landfall on the island, with one of his men praising his skill in finding it. But none of them heard the bell that Noland did to his puzzlement. He stares at the grand forest in front of them, and the whole crew sees the Joe birds for the first time. Shortly after, the bell rings out again, but this time everyone definitely hears it, one crew member even calling it a beautiful sound. They soon spot a collapsed man by the forest's edge. It's Seto, coughing and bleeding from the mouth. Nolan recognizes it, recognizes it as tree fever, or simply the plague. He tells the crew to vaccinate everyone with conine, conine which is the scientific name for hemlock. Nolan asks Seto if there is anyone still healthy on the island. We cut to Muse, who is being taken to the sacrificial altar. She seems calm and seemingly accepts her fate, even as her mother continues to weep and call out for her. The great Kashigami, a giant snake, rises from the lake just above the altar and is about to consume Muse, while the others, including Kalgara, look on. But just as this happens, Nolan suddenly appears and decapitates the snake with a single slash. The other Shandians, aside from Kalgara, who looks surprised but stays silent, call for Nolan and Muse's blood, even as Nolan swears that there is no need for anyone to die. All right. A lot happens. <laughs> Tense. Yeah, this Sacrifice gives us a good tense. Yeah, this gives us like a good look at the state of where things are and just like what they're dealing with right now. So there is like a play going on and to appease the gods, like they're doing these ritual sacrifices um in desperation. Um you know, suppose like the, the high priest is trying to communicate with the gods, and this is what they've de- they've decided they have to do. Um, so they take it very seriously. Um, and yeah, no one just kind of comes in and is like, uh, "Yeah, we're not doing that anymore." <laughs> Times are changing. <laughs> yeah. So, our thoughts on this one? Uh, something. That surprised me at the beginning of this flashback is we see the Shandians have wings when they were on Jaya. Hmm, I thought that would be like just I thought that would be just the Sky People thing, but yeah, they had wings in Jaya way back when. Yeah, that's something I, I was uh, thinking as well. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> and then yeah. at the very end of the chapter, we see. The snake, and I'm like, oh, it's the ruler of the sky. We know him. And then I turned the page. I was like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. So not not quite so much. <laughs> not quite so much. <laughs> Very heroic of Nolan. Just jump in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big old snake, and he got it in seemingly one slash, which is shocking. Again, just kind of showing like how how tough he is. Like he's not messing around. Oh yeah. And uh, Evan, does this um, altar look familiar to you? Oh yeah, seen that, seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's the same one that we see in Skypea, where the yep. Mary ended up. The uh, the exact same the one. Sacrificial altar. Yep. Still for the same purpose too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Some things don't change. I mean, hey, we got this beautiful sacrificial altar here. We might as well use it, right? <laughs> Can't let it go to waste. Can't let it go to waste. <laughs> uh. So they, they hear the, the sound of the bell, and that's what lured them here in the first place. They got their attention. Uh, they come to check it out. And yeah, they, they see that these people are... They they just need to have modern medicine, so they, they they they're aware of like what the situation is, and they're like, oh, we can help these people, so that they recognize it right away. But um, 
but Nolan, you know, interferes. Like he has good intentions, but he also doesn't consider the, the consequences of how people are going to react to him. So he, yeah. he does the right thing. He tries to save somebody, knowing that this is like a needle of sacrifice. Um, but, but also yeah, quite so. traumatic for the onlookers who just saw who they considered a god get beheaded in front of them. Right. So, yeah. So they don't. They don't understand. It's not going why he well. did this. Like what his intentions were. So yeah, they they are like upset because like, they they just like are they, now they think oh, we're gonna, all going to die now. We're going to be punished by by like the kami. Um. So like this guy just doomed us all. Um. It is. I love I I don't love it. It's just kind of like oh boy, this is awkward. But the uh, Nolan being like, you must have been terrified to Muse, who's just like, um, not at the time, but like I don't know, <laughs> like he doesn't get the context of the situation and how she was like, yep, I've I've accepted this fate, and then he I don't know, it's it's this weird because I'm like that's that's her that she was crying at the end there with like not her mother right so yeah. So I think suddenly everything just hit her all at once, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's it's this. Yeah, weird... It's got to be different in theory to be like, yeah, I'll sacrifice myself for the village. But then when you're actually tied down to a table and there's a massive snake standing over you, it's probably well, she didn't different emotions. She didn't start crying and screaming until after he killed the snake. So I don't know. It's weird. It's kind of weirdly, fr- not in a bad way. I'm just like the 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 suddenly everything hits her once the. The, the, the situation is altered dramatically. I think it's a situation where she was <laughs> she was ready to offer up her life and like she saw it as her doing her duty. Now she's being denied of fulfilling the duty that she was going to do for her people. So I think she's also in that boat too where she's yeah. like um like because I did not die, like my people are doomed and now it's my fault. Like yeah. you, you denied me the honor of doing this for my people. But it could also be like just a mix of emotion too. Like she could also be partly relieved. Um, but I think it's it's something that where she's yeah, she she feels like she's kind of let down her people. Kagura says nothing. He's not like yelling out with the others. He looks shocked, looks mad. <laughs> but he looks mad. But he doesn't he doesn't actually say anything. Yeah, at least now. Right. Anything else on this one? <laughs> Okay, let's move on to Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard, Volume 14, The Intruder, Commander Ace. Realizing the identity of the intruder, the Marines chase after Ace as he hides and takes on a new disguise. <laughs> Gee, I wonder what gave it away. <laughs> uh, I love the look on his face. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so now like, he he has like a mustache, and it looks like he took a like a coat as well, <laughs> like an officer. And he's eating, so <laughs> not, not missing a beat. He's like, "Oh, this food, I got to keep eating." <laughs> <laughs> and then the the rest of the uh, Marines are chasing uh, after him down the hallway. They pass down the hallway that he's hiding in, so they just missed him. Uh-oh. They didn't look in though. There's a man there, like. <laughs> Without his trousers, so <laughs> <laughs> would cause suspicion for sure. Hey, that man's not in regulation uniform. <laughs> All right, let's get Evan summary for the next chapter. Chapter two eighty eight curse. The Shanjians go absolutely ape shit after witnessing and the beheading of their god, Kashigami at the hands of some dude with a chestnut on his head. Before Nolan can explain his actions, he is rushed by Kalgura and blocks his spear with a clang. Kalgura then tosses a blade to Muse, telling her she should be ashamed for wanting to live and demanding she sacrifice herself for the village. Nolan, Nolan ain't having none of that and smacks the dagger from her hand, but in doing so, turns his back on Kalgura. He takes this opportunity to thrust his spear clean through the back of Nolan, accusing Nolan not only trespassing, but also Kami killing. Kagura states his death alone won't be enough to atone, so 100 of his men, not captured, will pay with their lives. Nolan pleads with Kagura and the Shandians, claiming their ways to be barbaric, 
that this archaic ceremony is stunting their progress. Nolan offers a deal. If he can successfully purge this evil that plagues the Shandians and their land, then they must stop this sacrificial ceremony for good. If he fails, Kagura can have, have it his way and sacrifice humans to his heart's content. The deal is struck and he is given one day to uphold his word. Nolan's men are caged and he begins his quest to save the day. As the captives grow restless, Musei inquires about Nolan and his men inform her <clears throat> that he's a botanist who travels the world discovering and studying new variants of plants. Meanwhile, in the Sheev's hut, the Shandian warriors are outraged that Noland has shown mercy after defying their gods. Kagura is tempted to hunt him down before his time is up. The chief speaks up saying, I don't have the power to hear the voices of the gods. However, even I can hear the words of a wise man. As dawn breaks, the town is hit by an earthquake. Kagura concluded, this is the anger of the gods and that Noland is to blame. He heads into the forest to seek retribution he quickly finds Nolan and to his glee finds him stuck between a rock and a hard place. Quite literally, Nolan has been pinched in a fissure between two large masses of land. Kagura smiles and instead of helping, says he wants to watch him struggle. It's cold. It's really cold. <laughs> hey, it's a serious uh, crime he committed. Yeah, thoughts on this one? Well, it's the first time we see Nolan in cover tree blows and um cover kind of like stabs him in the back which i'm not even wincing anymore when somebody gets stabbed through the chest because it happens <laughs> so often <laughs> and no one actually dies from it it's like a guarantee um, that you're going to survive at this point right it's just no it's just it's just a flesh wound it's just a through and through right through the center of my chest yeah nothing, nothing, nothing important in there Maybe hey, it's just showing, places in, you know, in this it's world. just showing how tough they are. So, yeah. Another chest stabbing. Like he doesn't even, is there an exit wound? I think there is. It doesn't really phase him. Yeah, it looks like it's piercing out from the yeah, other side. Yeah, but then in the, the but then in the next, like, like the scene where he's like, we set out to sea in the hopes of making the world a better place. Like there's no blood stain on his cravats. There's nothing. It's just like, <laughs> it seems like yeah. it's, it's it really <laughs> feels like that really just didn't even happen. Like he shook it off. He's got some internal bleeding though. He's got some blood coming out of his mouth. <laughs> I guess, yeah. That's about it. He's actually so. wearing a red coat. So oh, it's just nah, matching the blood out. perfectly. Okay. Yep. <laughs> no, actually, I actually think it's probably like blue or something or black. But yeah, I mean, it seems that uh Nolan is still set on helping these people, even though they're not willingly like trying to accept his help. They still don't trust him and they don't have any reason to. But he's trying to employ them to to at least like let him try to help them and let him like show that like he knows who he's talking about. So he, he's willing to put like his his crew on the line because he's that confident that he can help them. So uh, I think his crew all they, they also know the situation so they can put their trust in uh, in their captain. But it is a, a tough situation because they're also having to rely on these people that they don't know that well and hoping that they'll accept the uh, the deal that's being made here. Yeah, it's kind of tricky. I feel like both Kagura and Nolan are both kind of stubborn um, people who believe very strongly in their ways. And so it's kind of hard without communicating how they're feeling or what they're thinking. They're just kind of like, at odds yeah yeah and his crew here i think what they say about him is pretty telling they talk amongst themselves they say uh but he tends to stick his nose in everything he just can't leave that uh the sort of thing alone and not that we don't trust him mind you uh but when push comes to shove he always comes through for us so th they do have some level of faith in uh in the captain they, they see that like um it seems like they've been situations before where like they see that like he just wants to help people yeah, and yeah, they they know that he's going to be committed to it, and he's going to see it through one way or the other. Similar to the Shandians' view of Kagura, hmm. I would I would imagine. Yeah, because they they also have to pull out of faith. Also, trust in him. Warrior. Yeah. yeah, but there's also a moment right before Kagura leaves, um, and he bumps into Seto, and sa and Seto says, "What is progress?" And he kind of looks at him, 
in shock. Hmm. It's just kind of a cool moment because um, no one mentions progress in his speech saying when he was talking about how, you know, how barbaric the ceremony is and how archaic that way of thinking is. Yeah. Um, and that it like stunts uh, progress. So it's kind of cool that Seto kind of like picks up on that. And it's like, what is he, what is he talking about? Like what's, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> it's kind of planting that seed for Seto in particular. Yeah. And even, even the chief was kind of like, you know, I can, I can, understand the words of a wise man like i might not be able to understand the words of the gods but i can understand what the words of a wise man yeah yeah and he's trying to be reasonable about, about the situation like the, right. the the people are like getting upset they're shouting at him like what like why did we let him get away with this like should just let kagura kill him and their chief is like saying well there's no harm in waiting like let's see this through um you know if if he doesn't follow through then you know, we can, you know, you know, punishment if we need to, but you know, let's see if, if he can help us. So you know, he, he's trying to keep a cool head about this and, um, you know, see, see the logic in, in what's being presented. Yeah. Cogra seems pretty, pretty blinded, especially right at the end of the yeah. chapter where it's like this man who said he's trying to save your village is in need of assistance and he was, he wasn't even willing to help him. Yeah. Yeah, and going back to Seto, um, he says that he's been cured. So I think Seto's probably like the first one here. He's really like seeing that he's probably legitimate, that no one's legitimate. So he, he wants to possibly give him a chance, and like he seems to be intrigued by their ideas and their concepts. So I think he's the one who's like being the mostly progressive here and saying, oh, maybe there is a better way. So let's um, like l- like let's look into this. Like this could be. You know, something we can we can do. Nolan is not like comfortable. It's pretty brutal. <laughs> I don't know how he's still alive and just get squished. <laughs> yeah, the people see this earthquake uh, as also being a sign that oh yeah we're in trouble. The the, the commie's been killed. Um, it's all his fault. So like yeah, they're they're looking for pretty much any excuse to be like oh like we have to kill him. Like we need to go back to the sacrifices. We know that's that's what works, right? But yeah, Zoro and and and, and Renolan, like I'm saying, he's the only one of the only other characters I can see getting squished by two giant islands oh. and being like, <laughs> eh, it hurts, but it's whatever. I can still monologue while it's happening. <laughs> and not ask for help. And not ask for help. <laughs> yeah, this this doesn't hurt at all. Yeah, and it just seems like Kagura's um yeah, Kari doesn't seem to have the same faith that Seto and the Chief seem to have. So he's kind of here to watch over uh, Nolan to be like, hey, I- I'm here to take you out whenever, uh, you know, whenever we need to, because, you know, I'm going to have to. So uh, uh, might as well just wait here and watch. Right, uh, anything else before we move on? Ready to go, I think. I'm good. Okay. Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard, Volume 15, Military Court Coffee is Bitter. Ace sneaks into the military court meeting, but is not impressed by their coffee. Looks like no one's impressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's got like coffee drooling out of their mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I absolutely love that the sign says justice in moderation. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ace just kind of, you know, trying to blend right in. I would think at like a meeting like this, uh, this small, that you would know who's supposed to be attending it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, moving on to chapter two hundred eighty-nine, full moon. As no one continues to struggle to get out, desperate to help treat the Shandorans, Kagura watches. He taunts no one that his crew will be sacrificed for interfering with the Kami's sacrificial offering. As more people begin to die, the Shandorans prepare to, uh, to sacrifice no one's men, but warrior Seto pursues them to hold off. No one spends hours trying to free himself, even causing some of the earth to move, but it seems useless. No one declares that the sacrifices are pointless and a waste of innocent lives. Kagura reveals that the girl that no one saved from being sacrificed was his own daughter. 
At this time, they noticed another large snake approach, though a little smaller than the previous commie that was killed. Not wanting to be killed by the snake before being able to help the citizens, Dolan quickly explains that they had developed an antidote for the same tree fever plague that his people dealt with in the past that his people are now facing. Before the snake can eat the defenseless Noland, Calgar commits a sin and kills the snake, asking if Noland can truly save the village. Noland and his men quickly get to work, saving the villagers from being killed by the plague. Alright, so a little, a little change of heart here. A little progress. Yeah. Inching along. We find out Muse was Cogra's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that hit heavy. I was like, oh, damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think it kind of explains why Calgary is acting a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when the girl was saved. But he, he also believed that this was for the greater good. So he was willing to sacrifice his own daughter if it meant, you know, appeasing the gods. So he was making a sacrifice in that sense as well. But now he's seeing that, um, yeah, maybe maybe that wasn't needed. So he he has a change of heart here, and he possibly kills what he considers to be a kami, uh, not knowing what the consequences would be. But he he makes a decision. Yeah, and uh, Seto also stepping up here. So Seto's not willing to let the other people kill Nolan's uh, men prematurely. So he he stands up to them and he. He sits down in front of the cage and says, "We have to be better than this. Like we have to give them a chance. You know, we we have to honor the deal, and um, we can't just go around like killing these people because you know we're impatient. We think that, um, yeah, you know, there's no chance. So Seto, Seto um, is proving that he, like he he's been like taking like taking this seriously, and like the, these concepts have been really resonating with him. So I think yeah, this really shows like a development with, with his character." Seto gets it. He was also cured, so he's like, <laughs> these guys could be for real. And if there's a small chance, like, why not? Yeah. You know, why lose hope in that? Yeah, he seems a little bit more open minded than maybe the other citizens. Yeah, and Cogra. And it's so frustrating to see these two argue because it's just like, they're both just so self righteous, or so they're not really like <laughs> having a conversation. They're both just like so stuck in their ways. Mm. Yeah, but no one's like really desperate to try to like have Calgar like actually hear his words. So like he's saying like you people need to like listen to me like this isn't needed like I can help you guys like don't don't just stand there and like <laughs> let me die like so like, he's really like pleading and trying to like get the point across. It took a long time to get there and a lot of insults to get there, <laughs> <laughs> whether he meant them to be insults or not. But yeah, they finally got there. Take a chance on the chestnut. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and then um he calls Calgary heartless. Um like he's like, Do you even care about that girl that was gonna be killed yesterday? And that's when he finds out that um Muse was his daughter and it shows like how Calgary was like so convinced that this was needed. We get the happy montage. <laughs> montage won't be the last. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I really do like this um the moment though where it shows that the snake is about to eat Nolan like in the middle of the um like the fissure and like he he shouts like one last um you know statement like um in desperation looks like people are like destroying progress um like your antiquated ways are evil and yeah Calgary has this moment where he kills the snake and saves Nolan and he asks, like, what did I kill? No one's just like, it's a snake. It wasn't a god. So, yeah, Calgary is asking if he can really save his people. And Nolan confidently says that he can. Yeah, why did they lead with that? That should have been their <laughs> leading remarks. Can you really well, save you my village? It. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Well, you saying, but they weren't let's listening to Let's start with that next time. <laughs> Yeah, so it took a lot of convincing to get there because it, it, I think it is it is difficult to try to get this point across to them because these people have yeah. been so set in their ways and they have these strong beliefs. And he's trying to get this point across as something that is defying what they're used to. 
so when somebody is so set in their ways, sometimes like it's hard to convince them otherwise. And that th he's asking them to like believe him on his word alone. Uh, so, so Kagura does kind of take a loop of faith here. So he, he is putting his trust in, in Nolan, which he, he realizes like this could be a big mistake, but he's, he does it thinking that, okay, well, if Nolan is right, then yeah, you know, this is maybe worth, worth trying. So yeah. But the deal that they have, he's not, it's not a big risk. Like, yeah, but, um, like I said, it's just something that they, they believe so strongly up to this point. So it was Culture kind of shaking his faith to his, his core. And it was a big ask to have these people pretty much like defy what they believe this whole time. And like they see it as a potential risk of, they, they could all be wiped out. So like they're looking for signs of doom. So like when the earth starts shaking, like, oh, this is because of, like, because of this, we didn't do the sacrifice. So they, they're thinking that they're going to be punished. So this could wipe them all out. So yeah, so they're they're afraid of the punishment because if they don't do this, this could come back and just kill them all. So that that's what the risk is. So it seems like there's no risk because we know the the truth, and no one knows the truth. These people don't. Then we do have that the nice sequence where there's no words on like these few pages here, um, where it just kind of shows. Uh, so it shows like Nolan um, has left the Fisher. He's been taken out. There's nobody at the altar. Um, there's like a full moon. Things look good, and they're uh, no one's people are giving the the medicine to the citizens. Everybody's trying to get cured, so now they're relieved to see that no one was telling the truth, and people are resting easy now. They're celebrating, and um, you know, it's a terrible reunion. So everybody's like really happy that they put their faith in Nolan here, and it worked out. Yay! I'm sure <laughs> nothing bad will happen from this point forward. It's smooth, smooth sailing. sailing. <laughs> Okay, uh, anything else before we move on? I don't have anything to add, but in this SBF, SBS, they mention um, the scene that we talked about volume or so ago when um, Chopper's antlers leave his head in his hat. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, he got a lot of mail about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, I got a mountain of postcards pointing this one out. The one thing I can say is ever say to everyone is the truth isn't limited to what you can see. <laughs> Chopper was so startled at the time that even his horns jumped up in amazement. He altered his body to communicate that to us. In a way, that may have been his own sort of coolness, don't you think? In a way, <laughs> that may uh, have been his uh, own sort of uh, cool, uh, don't you think? Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect answer. Yep. On the opening picture for chapter 284, Sara, you drew a very adorable dog smoking a cigarette. Even coming from you, Oda-sensei, this is unforgivable. Are you trying to make dogs unhealthy? Well, oh, I wasn't paying you close enough attention. I'm terribly sorry. I'll give Sanji a good talking to over this. That guy! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it is fun when he, like, tries to blame his decisions on, like, his characters. Yes. So good. <laughs> It's the Mr. Three floating thing all over again. Like, <laughs> like, oh no, he was actually floating on a specific small piece of wood that you didn't see or whatever it was. <laughs> well, at least, at least like that one was like, that was a straight mistake. This was more like a visual gag that he was explaining. Oh, people. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought this was a good mistake as well, but. <laughs> no, I, I think that was intentional. I think he knew what he was yeah, doing. Yeah, I think that was a joke. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move on to Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard, Volume 16. Vice Admiral Comil dislikes the base's bitter coffee. <laughs> Comil is also unimpressed by the base's coffee. Shit coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, this coffee's so bad that we have to dedicate, like, a few chapters of this cover story to it. Yeah, right? <laughs> Okay, let's get uh, Sean summary for the next chapter. Chapter 290, The Light of Shandora. Nolan and Kalgara look upon a young snake, while their companions raise their voices with fear over it harming them. 
Nolan seems unconcerned and begins to ask Kalgor something, but the Shandian warrior finishes his thought by confirming that the snake is the grandchild of the great Kashigami. Something about this situation causes Nolan and Kalgara to laugh uproariously with each other, much to the confusion of Nolan's crew, as the two were trying to kill one another a little more than a week ago. But the other Shandians are pleased to see Kalgara being so friendly with someone else, with one saying they'd never seen Kalgara laugh like that before. Kalgara leads Nolan and the others to a cliff nearby, where they descend down, while the sound of the bell rings ever louder. Finally, they reach the destination Nolan has sought for so long, Shandora, the City of Gold. The Admiral and his crew are shocked, and then delighted upon realizing what they have accomplished. Kalgara tells Nolan's crew they can take as much of the gold as they can fit into their ship, aside from the bell tower. He says it is the least they can do for the people who saved the tribe from extinction. Nolan is confused, as he thought that the Shandians had been protecting the city for ages. Kalgara says the only part of the city they truly seek to protect is the bell and the stone poneglyph beneath it. Kalgara says that the city of Shandora was destroyed in a battle ages ago in an effort to protect that stone, and that a sacrifice of such a magnitude by their ancestors leaves them no choice but to protect the stone just as fervently. Nolan is impressed by the size of the bell, and Kalgara says the sound of the bell is a message, and that they continue to ring the bell to send the message to their heaven-sent ancestors so they might always find their way back to the land. The bell represents the glory of Shandora's past and is called the Light of Shandora. Nolan agrees and tells Kalgara how the bell's sound brought him to the island, even in the midst of a terrible storm. He talks to the snake again, who likes the sound of the bell, and wonders if the snake will grow into a great serpent like its grandparent. Kalgara asks Nolan to stay on the island as long as he wishes. He wants to hear more of his travels, and since Nolan wants to conduct further research, as well as oversee tree fever treatment, he is happy to agree. Nolan's men, meanwhile, show off an eternal pose in a map they found amongst the treasure, which Kalgara assumes they took from another invader. We cut to a montage, montage of Calgara and Nolan being bros. <laughs> of Calgara and Nolan being bros, helping the island to grow new plants, and generally just being awesome bros and such. They drink and party, tell stories, and <laughs> god damn, I think I shipped them. But then a month has passed, and something seems to have changed. The Shandian chief tells the villagers not to say anything to Nolan or his crew about what they saw last night. Another Shandian says that he knew that they would never be able to see eye to eye, that they are still men who have no qualms about killing gods or trampling on history. Nolan arrives with his men looking for Kalgara, but the villagers say nothing to him. Nolan is shocked by this until Seto coldly tells him that Kalgara doesn't want to see him anymore, and then he asks how long Nolan until how long until Nolan and his men leave the island. The Admiral's sailors are shocked, but Nolan tells them to stop and that they need to focus on their business in the forest. The Shandians claim to have no sympathy for them, and even Kalgara, who has isolated himself, claims that he never wants to see Nolan again. If he does, he might just kill him. What the hell happened? <laughs> <laughs> what a ride. <laughs> Lover's tryst. <laughs> All right, uh, Evan, what did you think of this one? Yeah, our emotional roller coaster. We saw the the bromance begin and end all in one chapter. <laughs> um, but yeah, we get some cool history here. We get to see Shandora again in the bell. Um, also, side note: Nolan uh, brought the pumpkins. <laughs> the Kanash. <laughs> yeah, the Kanash. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's a nice little, little detail. Little detail yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we get to see another poneglyph. Or the, the same poneglyph, but we get to see it um, in its proper place this time, I think. Wasn't it? Or did, uh, or no, did Robin not see the poneglyph yet? Yeah, Robin hasn't seen this poneglyph. So there was other writing that she found. That's right. She was looking at some, some other ruins. Yeah. So. Yeah, so this is um, so there's even further history here. So Calgary is explaining the history of the city. That's now history to them now. So th this is history for them too, because this is another 400 years in the past where there was a great war over protecting this poneglyph. So it still stands to this day, even though they don't know why it's important, like what it says. They just know it's important, so they want to make sure it's being protected. Another uh, beautiful two-page spread here of the, the city. Yeah. yeah, digging these montage spreads. 
montage. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- uh, this time we we see the the gold bell like in the dead center of the city, so we see what, right. where the bell is supposed to be, and then the uh, the Shindorans are very generous with the gold. Like they're like, yeah, take as much as you want. Just leave the bell. Like you guys can have the rest of the gold. Sweet deal. So yeah, things things had had definitely turned. So the like, Calgora and Nolan were acting like best buds. Um, like they really seem to have like this camaraderie and like companionship that like seems to be something that neither one of them experienced before. So they they are now like like laughing like they they're like they know each other like their whole lives. And like everybody's happy, like things are good, like the people are healed. Um, you know, the um the crew is getting some gold as like, you know, thanks for what they've done for the people. And for some reason, um yeah, th- things change because yeah, everybody's being cold to them. So something must have happened that caused this rift now. So they went from being like best buds to now being like, we don't want to talk to them, we just want to leave. Like we're so grateful for what they did. But you know, out of gratitude, we'll let them go. Um, even though they've done something to to harm us, we'll, we'll let them go. We'll just kind of like you know, keep keep our we'll bite our lips and keep our mouths shut for now yeah. and, until they're they're gone. Now, even Seto too, who was also like yeah, who seemed to be like on their side from like the get go. Even he's kind of like turns his back on them. Something is amiss. How about you, Sean? Yeah, um, I mean, it's just, I love the bro montage. I love them just being <laughs> dudes and like, I don't know, maybe cuddling. I don't know. Um, like, uh, it's just like, I don't, it, it seems so abrupt, even though it says like a month later. So like, it, it's the idea is obviously be like, okay, what the hell happened? But like, right. we don't see it in the montage. We don't think, I, I don't think so. Like it's very confusing and 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 deliberately so and i do love the i mean just the little things i love pointing out these little art details kagura being very confused by the pumpkin all of them are like (laughs) like, he's like here it's a pumpkin and he's just like what the heck is this shit i don't know about this one (laughs) nolan that's a weird looking thing I love once again Nolan being entirely unconcerned or just looking at like plants and stuff while a tiger chases the crew and they're all freaking out. <laughs> um, get another big old bonfire. Where did we get the bonfire with the straw hats? Is that the sky PR? Yeah, that was um before like around the sacrificial altar. That's right. So yeah, that was before they set out for like uh uh for El Dorado. Right. Like the night before, yeah. <laughs> Looks like the dances, the fire dances haven't changed a whole lot. <laughs> Same spirit. All right, you guys ready to move on? Yeah. Ready. Okay, Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard, Volume 17. The top secret naval reconnaissance ship returns to port. The naval ship returns from its top secret mission. Not too much to go off of yet. Not too secret with top secret written on the <laughs> right on the ship. That's how you know the ship's important. Yeah, right. Hope nothing bad happens to it. <laughs> All right, Evan, let's get your summary for the next chapter. All right. Chapter two ninety one will be the, we'll be here. Nolan stands at the golden bell alone, calling out to his friend Cog- Cogra, asking for an explanation. He says they are setting sail soon and he doesn't want to part ways like this. His words are met by a flying spear, which narrowly misses him, grazing his cheek. Kagura warns Nolan to never show his face to him again. In the middle of the night, before Nolan and his crew set sail, Muse sneaks from the village in search for, of answers. She finds the doctor awake and confides in him what's been upsetting the Shandians. Nolan has cut down the ancestral trees. The Shandians believe the souls of their ancestors are guided by the sound of the bell to reside within these trees. The doctor examined, explains that the trees were already dead and infected with tree fever, the very disease that they had been ridding the whole island of. The following morning, morning, Noland is informed of this conversation and feels guilty 
and asked his men to leave their treasure from El Dorado behind before they set sail. Hearing the same information, Kagura takes off towards the shore. The Shandians ring the golden bell, which can be heard from Nolan's ship, now sailing away. Just then, Kagura arrives at the shore, wades into the water, and yells to Nolan, asking him to come back and that they will ring the bell so that he can find his way back to them. Nolan, fighting back tears, yells back saying, we'll meet again, I promise you. Aww. <laughs> yeah, so that answers that question. Yep. But it was like, I don't know. It was just a failure to communicate again. Yeah, so much would be solved like, if they all just kept talking to each other. Like... <laughs> <laughs> right, and like Muse, Muse like sneaks it, sneaks over to their encampment at night. Just sees the first person who's awake and decides to in, give them all this information, which doesn't get to Nolan until he's like on the ship the next day, like ready to set sail. <laughs> like, why didn't she just go straight to Nolan, <laughs> or why didn't Nolan get this information right away? It makes no sense. Well, Nolan was sleeping. <laughs> like, okay, you don't wake you don't wake up a man in his. Oh, in certainly his not. Oh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. this isn't important. This isn't no, important. No, no. Yeah, I, I think I think they just saw like the damage was done, and th- like they they just felt like it was too late to to fix that uh, because they've already like destroyed the forest in their opinion. So I think this this shows that like Nolan and his men aren't like anti God. They were just like we don't want you to be doing these things that are not going to help. And you're actively killing people for no reason. Like you guys can have like your belief, you can believe in the ancestors and stuff. And uh, you can have that, that, um, like that faith, but you know, this is killing you. So we have to get rid of these trees. So like, yeah, so they're respectful of like their beliefs. Like they, they weren't trying to actively do anything against their beliefs, but it just happened to be something that they weren't aware of. They didn't have all the details. So they acted not realizing that this is important to them. So it just kind of was like, again, a situation where it's like these people will believe a certain thing. And like Nolan is doing these things that kind of challenge what they believe. Yeah, that's all true. I just think this could have been avoided again. <laughs> just like their conversation earlier, like um, they both act first and then ask questions later. And in doing so, make problems that aren't problems. I think part of it is just like a, a difference of like culture and just like beliefs and also strong personality. So I think it's a combination of these types of things. No, I agree. I understand like the miscommunication. Yeah. I understand it not working out. It's just frustrating as a reader to just be like reading through it and being like, why isn't anyone handling this? better <laughs> i get why they're not but i'm yeah. just saying as a reader it's frustrating <laughs> yeah so they so from their standpoint they go and see this forest they cut down the stuff that was important to them like these are the trees that like our ancestors reside in they kill their ancestors so like they're, they're upset so sometimes when you're mad at people you don't think logically uh also you don't think oh let's have a rational conversation like sometimes you're just like so mad and you're like no, I'm just gonna shut down, and I'm just gonna like stay mad about this, and like like I'm not gonna talk about it until I'm ready. So I think that's kind of like what happened in this case here, where people were just like so mad at the situation, and they were offended by this. They weren't ready to sit down and talk about it. And uh, no one, no one respects that as well. So when he found out the truth, uh, he said the villagers' anger is completely justified. And he thinks back on Calgary's words, like we respect our ancestors as we would gods. So that was like he knew how important like this would be to Calgary. Um, and then no one says there are no excuses for it. I did what I thought was right. Uh, they said that as well as boasting of the city's existence, that the sound of the bell guide the souls of the ancestors to this island. We cut down the trees that house those souls. So from the the standpoint of the the Shandorans, like this is something that like. They, they firmly believe in and maybe they, they thought that they understood this more than um you know like Noah's crew did because like they had conversations about stuff they might not have said this like explicitly but they might have thought like they understood like you know this kind of thing now that they've been here for a while so they might have not really known like how like what the intentions were of like Nolan and his men 
I mean, they, they probably should have had more faith in him and known that there was a good <laughs> should, reason behind it. Have. Right. <laughs> to, to automatically think that that was a malicious act, I feel like, is to jump yeah. to conclusions. Um, but I thought, the, I think the point that uh, Muse makes is interesting when she addresses her village, telling them of the situation and saying, like, you know, there's one poison tree, and if we sacrifice that tree, we can save the rest. And it, it was very, like, reminiscent of the sacrifice that she was going to make for the village. Like, if we sacrifice this one you know, entity, mm. it'll, it'll protect the rest of the, um, people or in this case, trees. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting parallel to draw for you say to get her point across. Yeah. It's like, we sacrifice people, like we had to sacrifice some trees in order to save the rest of the island. Yeah. Yeah. And she does say to them as well, uh, even if it was for your research, even if you didn't know about the trees, meaning the villagers anger, uh, anger won't be quelled. So before you set sail, I want to at least know why you did it. So she's saying that even though they, they probably realized that there was a good reason behind it, um, just the fact that they did it was enough to make them upset. Gotta talk to each other. <laughs> hey, can I... Is this... Are we are so, so, like, I don't know. It's it's stupid that the Shandians were like, oh, I'm not going to say anything. Just get out of here. Very dumb. It's also dumb that Nolan wasn't like... Hey, that plague to 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 like like it. I'm not even saying like he needs to ask their permission necessarily. Just let them know about the status of the ongoing process of getting rid of this disease. They're like, hey, we're currently called, cutting down like the tre- the trees down. Here's what it's called. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's called tree fever. Tree fever. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it comes from like you know the sky then it's not yeah like the, i'm sure i'm sure it's not something that's that's related to trees in any way <laughs> yeah uh my my justification is um based on the words that um they explained to muse is that um they had to work fast so it seemed like it was just like an urgent thing they didn't think to stop let's go tell them what's going on like we just need to start working now because we, we noticed this. we have to like get rid of these as fast as possible so I think they were just kind of set on their mission. And again, they probably didn't think anything of it. So they weren't like, hey, by the way, we're going to cut down these trees because they didn't think they would have to. They're just like, this is what we're doing. Like, we didn't realize that this was important to them. So I think they're just like, we're, we're just doing what we need to. And there was no real reason to report this and explain it because there's no uh, significance to it in their eyes. Yeah, so he, he, um, he um, Nolan's member also says, uh, you know those trees were so precious, and we didn't even explain. I'm sorry. Uh, we might not be forgiven even with an explanation, but a botanist would never damage a forest for that reason. Trust me, the Armo doesn't hate gods or deities. So he's even saying here, like maybe we could have told you guys, but we just didn't think anything of it. Yeah, right. Like no one's in the wrong. It's just a, it's just a lack of communication. Yeah, which is unfortunate, but you know that's how things played out. But yeah. by the end, at least they they got to the bottom of it and. Yeah, you know, they they ended on good terms. Like it might be, it gets sad that it was like the way that it was. But before the one of those men set out, they at least knew that they were forgiven. They they understood what the reasons were, and yeah. So now um, to make up for it, like, well, next time you come by, like, we'll ring the bell for you. You know, we'll see each other again. So they, they try to leave it on like a like a positive note. Glad it gets resolved. Yeah, for sure. I forgot something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, what was it? No, no, no. I'm quoting the <laughs> the sailor who didn't get the gold. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they decide um, as a peace offering, they decide to leave the gold behind to kind of make up for what they did. So just to show that they were they were sorry. So. They they didn't need to. The gold was given to them, so it's just like a sign to show, yeah. hey, we you know no hard feelings. You guys keep the gold, like you know th- that's that's our way of saying sorry. Yeah, I would have still taken some. Sorry, <laughs> like they I'm sure somebody like, snuck some Elzerado, in their pocket. Come on, I'm sorry. I'm take I'm taking a good handful of doubloons at the very least. Like... <laughs> but I like how desperate like the. Um, the Shandians are ringing the bell at the end. Like, we, have to, we need to make sure that they hear it. Bring as loud as you can. It's like, it's like a whole effort. Yeah. 
no one we're so sorry yeah so now we know why the bell is so important because it's meant to be a symbol between these two warriors that have become like like brothers and it's their way of saying like you know we'll meet again like this will be like your guiding sound to find us again all right ready to move on ready yep ace's great search for blackbeard volume 18 an arson incident flares up on the top secret naval reconnaissance ship the marines rush out to assist the returning reconnaissance ship so uh <laughs> yeah something uh bad is happening to the ship and it's all hands on deck Meanwhile, Ace is still trying to drink this coffee and still not enjoying it. Yep. There's got to be more to this bitter coffee subplot. <laughs> yeah, something's up with this. Something's afoot. I think it's just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I mean, I guess. This is a gag. <laughs> okay. More to it. I want answers. <laughs> I need to know. Why is this coffee so bitter? It's all the justice that they Why does he the keep coffee. drinking it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Chapter 292, to me, like the half moon hidden by the clouds. Upon returning home to his kingdom, Nolan reports on the details of his journey, including the city of gold. Five years later, Nolan is granted permission to return to Jaya to get the gold. But the king insists on coming uh, and providing his own crew over Nolan's men. After a treacherous journey, Nolan is horrified to find half the island is now missing. Furious, the king orders Nolan to be executed. Despite the protests of his men that had actually been to the city of Shindora, the king had planted a false witness to testify against Nolan's story being true. In his final moments, as the crowd shouts at him for being a liar, Nolan's thoughts are of Calgara, wondering what could have happened to them. Just one year prior, on what seemed to be a normal day, part of the island of Jaya was blasted into the sky on the knock-up stream. The section of land contained the gold bell landed at the tip of Giant Jack. Hearing the golden bell and now seeing the new large chunk of barfs, the current Kami demanded that his people take the land for themselves. Kagura attempted to fight off the invaders, thinking of his friend Nolan and how he must fulfill his promise to meet again. Yeah, so truly tragic. Yeah, that's sad. Yeah, so we now have the full picture of uh, Nolan the Liar. What really not, happened? Not quite a liar, seemingly. Just, a, just you know, there might have been some truth <laughs> to that. <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> yeah, Sean, you want to uh, start off on this one? Uh, sure. Um, man, what a fucking, like, just just that's like just like oda like i'm gonna draw the most punchable most asshole king in the universe <laughs> oh, like, just, say the same thing. just the most like just <laughs> despicable f just fucking asshole just <laughs> just the word like this guy Perfect honestly honest honestly i think wapple is less less of a douchebag looking like La wapple at least looks kind of funny this guy's just like <laughs> just, uh, you have no redeeming qualities, sir. That yeah, nailed it. <laughs> Very like his, his hat, his his crown even looks like a jester's cap. Like he's just so stupid. Mm -hmm. He just sucks. He's the worst. <laughs> yeah, and they even have like the fake uh witness guy. Also a dumbass. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, it's such an unjust, an unjust ending for such a epic explorer and yeah. character. Yeah, I think that's the perfect way to describe it. It's like an unjust situation. Yeah. Yeah, and um, to to Sharon's point, I feel like Oda does do a great job of conveying like the type of character <laughs> that these people have. Like yep. you, you can like for the reader, you can tell like what their motivations are in these cases. Like you can tell that these are not like good people. So, yeah, like Oda, typ typically like um, like this this type of character, like you can tell like 
it is not like an honorable king. We've seen like good kings like um, like Cobra in the past, and compared to like Wapple, it, we can see like you know <laughs> how Oda treats these types of characters. Um, so he like he's so petty that like he wants to put Nolan to death because they couldn't find the the goal that he he was saying. So he plants his false witness to be like, hey, let's uh, well we have evidence here. We we can get him executed. Even though this guy was not on the um, part of the expedition. The people who actually were on the expedition are dying. It like they're trying to corroborate no one's story, but like nobody's hearing it. The king has the absolute final say in the situation and uh, basically puts on like the sham uh, situation to uh, put no one to death because he he wanted to. Yeah, and then then we uh, see how. The sky people react to this <laughs> this virus showing up on their doorstep now. They're immediately that's ours like, now. oh, that's ours. Yeah, we gotta take it <laughs> over. <laughs> Mine, it's not first. Dibs. <laughs> I call dibs. <laughs> it's like just the worst. Yeah, so also um kind of, kind of to the same point, you can see like uh like this kami, like it doesn't look like a good benevolent kami. Uh, so yeah, th- this dude the uh, just looks like a jerk, and he uh, kind of shows it here by attacking the the Shandians who ha- have like no idea w- what just happened. They're now displaced from their home, and they have no idea like w- where they are. They're just kind of up in the sky now, and they're fighting for their lives and their their land. It's messed up, and it's cool that we get to see the knock upstream um, moment. Yeah, and how and how the Vars is like literally skewered by the. Um, giant Jack. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting because you would assume that the beanstalk would come from Earth when it's, it was already in the sky. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Like... Interesting. And also, <laughs> like, these random people will show up and they have wings too. Yeah. Like, I find it so interesting that the Shandians and the sky people just both just happen to have wings. Yeah. That's interesting. Makes you wonder like, what they have in common, like, why they would both in this area have wings. But they don't really fly also, with ever. No. Huh? No. <laughs> no that's yeah. That. yeah. Do we get um, the name of the ruler in the sky here? Nola? Um, I believe so. Yeah. I think Nola's the name of the ruler in the sky. That's the, the little. Oh, star. there it is. Yep. Yep. Not so little <laughs> anymore. No. Yeah. So that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so tough situation uh, ends ends in tra- a tragedy. Uh, something that seemed like a hopeful promise has been unfulfilled, but n- that's what the um, you know why the the golden bell is so so important to them. Hey, okay, anything else? Mm-hmm. Okay, let's get Sean's summary for the next chapter. Chapter two ninety three, Bolero. I just want to say that the the art for this one is like my favorite. It's like Luffy and the, the crew is like a basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Usopp, who's in like a weird a one. I don't I don't get like he's wearing like pom poms. Okay, I guess he's the cheerleader. I guess he's okay, he's a cheerleader, I guess. Okay. <laughs> but yes. Yeah. Chapter two ninety three yeah. Valero. <laughs> the young wiper and the Shandian chief talk about Kalgara's last stand, how the great warrior continued to shout, Bring back the light of Shandora. Even even one ringing of the bell would have satisfied Kalgara, who believed until the end that the sound would bring Nolan back. Much later, a northern blue sailor came to the island and told them what happened to Nolan, how he kept telling the truth even as he was executed for it. But it was too late, as Kalgara had died fighting, forever hoping to bring his friend Nolan back. Wiper wonders if they could, if they could ring the bell again, if and if it might if it might reach Nolan. The Shandian chief hopes so. And our flashback finally returns to the present day as Isa be- begs Wiper to run as they die and as they will die in Eneru's assault if they don't. High above, Eneru is planning on just that, declaring the entire land an eyesore as he sends lightning down to purge the land and exalt himself as the mighty Kami. Uh, he spots the he spots the claimy oh dude, sorry. Um Homes, totems, and other valuables are destroyed, but the statue of Kalgar remains standing. The Shandians look on in horror, having previously evacuated to a safer location. Back on Angel Island, Captain McKinley and the White Berets are evacuating as best they can. 
but everyone is running frantically around and screaming as the lightning continues to cause an unprecedented level, unprecedented level of devastation. McKinley laments on the tragedy that has befallen Skypea and shudders how to think to think of how much worse it would have been if they had not listened to Conus. And seemingly, at this time, a large lightning bolt appears to completely decimate I Angel Island. Oh, jeez. At the Going Mary's location, Conus reflects on the sequence of events from her initially reporting to the Straw Hats to Pagaya's injury at Enaru's hands. Back aboard the Maxim, Enaru sadistically laughs at all the chaos and carnage he has caused, and he charges even more lightning to destroy the island. This is approaching serious overkill at this point, dude. <laughs> at Heaven's Gate on the White Sea, a few citizens notice that someone has fallen through the clouds. Enaru passes by the God Shrine in his ship and destroys it in the process, stating that it no longer serves a purpose. The consequence, blah, blah, blah. the consequences of this sends debris from the explosion, landing in the Shandor ruins in the proximity of an unconscious Nola. Enaru affirms that this is his only interest now is the Golden Bell. Coincidentally, Wiper asks Nico Robin about the bell having heard her speak of it before. Realizing that's where Enaru is headed, he asks he asks Robin about the location. She tells him that Giant Jack penetrated the city of Shandor near its center, and the center is where the bell was originally located, so logically the bell must be somewhere near the top. Enaru pauses for a moment, realizing there are two voices approaching him. It's Nami and Luffy, who are running towards an Enaru under the impression that Nami is still aboard the Maxim. Luffy states that he will not let Enaru get away. All right. He wants to uh, start on this one. It's getting intense. Things are ramping up. Yeah. Kind so of it's getting uh, more, and more destructive. Yeah. You know, yeah. Good transition to bring us back into the current situation. Now that we have the context for why this bell is so important, uh, we know that Andrew is going after it. And, um, you know, and now like Andrew is causing all this destruction, and you know Luffy is dead set on going after Andrew here. Any thoughts on this one? I mean, it's just, it's just this is Andrew at his peak Joker moment, just like <laughs> <laughs> just the absolute most like just just Green Goblin over the fucking bridge, just being like, "I am the most evil bitch in the universe right now, and it feels great." Like he's just, he's just such a such a just, I a god am I? Just it's like, all right, buddy, take it down a notch. <laughs> he's making uh, Morgan look so modest. He really is at this right? point. Looks like I could. Cool. <laughs> That man's pretty great. Like he's not as great as me, but he's I, yeah. I got to take some pointers from him. Like, <laughs> yeah, he, he's just looking down on them. Like, look at all the little angels scurrying around, the, like little ants. So it just kind of really shows like how little he cares about them, and like, he just finds amusement out of it. Like, they're just like toys for him. Even his old stomping grounds, he's like, whatever. I don't give a shit about this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Just blow that shit up. Yeah, he blew up his homeland, so I think this little like yeah, hide like uh doesn't is really probably not a big deal for him. Yeah. <laughs> also, he can have his like perfect unlimited farce. Like, I don't get the appeal. I don't. I don't get it. Why does he want? He, <laughs> he just wants unlimited farce because it's special. Like, well, it's like compare. It's co comparatively here. Like, land is such a scarcity that it's it's mm -hmm. valuable. It's it's like kind of supply and demand. So because there's a little bit over here, it seems like such a big deal. So for him, he's like, oh, like I can go somewhere where there's endless bars. Like that's going to be like really special because, you know, we have like this little tiny patch of land. Like why fight over this little patch of land? Like I have so much land. So for him, like like to us, I mean, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. But like to like Andrew and the sky people, like the, like the virus has been like a sacred thing for them that like the, like the concept of just having like as much as you want is appealing to Andrew. So he wants to be able to rule over like, like a giant piece of land like that. Yeah, I get that. I'm just, I'm just picturing him alone with just endless land around him. <laughs> like this dude can okay, teleport. No, <laughs> like I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah, I, no. it's, it's almost like, um, you know, kind of like a dog chasing a car. So it's like, yeah. even if a dog like 
like caught the car. Like, okay, now what do you do with it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I, I just, think it's just kind of like the, the concept of <laughs> like getting this thing that seems like unatta- unobtainable. Right. I think it's just like the idea of that. So I think once he does get it, he probably won't be satisfied. Certainly not. And just another little note here. We have another uh, musical term for a chapter. So we're kind of back to the, the music terms. Hmm. Did you look this one up? Um, I, I did. It's like, it's like, um, Doesn't like I think it's, it's kind of got like uh, Spanish influences. I think it's kind of like during like a fast pace kind of kind of music piece. That kind of lines up. It's just like ramping up. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of these uh, the music terms, like, uh, <laughs> Um, some of them are show up, show up in the uh, Zelda as well. Ocarina of Time. Oh, cool! They have like certain like uh, songs that uh, like Bolero of Fire, like certain Native Water. Like those were like um, like little songs that you would have that would bring you to like the temple, like associated with it. So you, you'd use those songs to like teleport. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, anything else? I'm good. I'm good. Okay, moving along. Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard, Volume 19. Pirates set fire to the ship out of spite. There'll be trouble if the top secret information burns up. The reconnaissance ship was sabotaged, putting the top secret information obtained at risk. <laughs> oh no. Uh oh. So some I got problems with coffee now. <laughs> <laughs> I love how all the Marines are taking the same exact pose. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, even the ones that got on the boat, yeah. All of them. Yeah. Someone's yeah, in a little life raft like doing it. Yeah. That's, That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, so like, some pirates uh, were just like, I, I, I don't know if it's like targeted. They're just like, oh, there's a marine ship. Let's just set fire to it. But yeah, this, this thing's now uh, about to go up in flames. Okay, let's get Evan's summary for the next chapter. Chapter 294, Kingdom Come. Enru, aboard the Ark Maxim, reaches the pinnacle of Giant Jack, hoping to find the Golden Bell when he senses a pursuer closing in. It's Captain Luffy, and he's hauling ass despite the massive golden ball he's dragging in tow. Enru, a little impressed but mostly unamused, sends a lightning bolt destroying the st- stalk below Luffy, sending him falling. Luffy is able to grab hold of Giant Jack Enru announces he has something interesting to show Luffy and disappears. Just then, Nami arrives, parking her waiver on Luffy's face. But before they make their getaway, they notice something ominous forming in the clouds above. A massive sphere sphere of cloud and lightning has formed directly above Angel Island. Enru calls out his finishing move, Kingdom Come, as the sphere drops, eviscerating everything in its path. Angel Island is obliterated, just a gaping hole remains. Nami insists that they make their getaway, but Luffy simply replies, I can't do that. Remembering Mont Blanc Blanc Cricket's determination and knowing the truth, Luffy states, El Dorado really exists, so I'm going to ring that golden bell. You do it, Luffy. Let's go. (laughs) Let's go. Nami saying no. Sorry. Nami saying no to to more treasure. I know. I wrote that down too. I was like, like that. It's a rare, rare well, currency. See that look, we've already got. She does point out, like, look, the you've got a huge thing of gold stuck to your arm. We can get that off, and that's probably worth a ton of money. So, like, just <laughs> come on, like, it's fine. But like, passing up even more gold, character growth. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this, I think there's one thing that Nami values more than gold, and that's her life. It's her own life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one thing. Yeah, I think this is a great chapter for Luffy, and it just really shows like why he's such a great character. Like even like in the face of like this massive destruction, like Luffy is dead set on following his goals and doing what he wants to do here, and what's important to him. So to him, it's important to go ring this bell and find it. Uh, for his friend that he met uh, for cricket. So, yeah. So even with all this going on, this crazy chaos and like the destruction and 
like people like dying over here. Luffy's like, I'm I'm still gonna go fight uh, for this bell here. So I'm gonna go uh, like drag this giant ball, and that's not gonna stop me. I'm gonna I'm still gonna do what I need to do. So great. You kind of get a little bit of the spirit of Noland and um, uh, Kagura in this moment too. I feel like for Luffy, he's kind of channeling yeah. both of them a little bit. Yeah, that was a great a great moment. And you even see him like flashing back to when he when when Cricket's talking about um, like his dream, kind of kind of channels his dream in this moment. Yeah, he just wants him to be able to hear the bell, be like, "Hey, it, it's real, it exists." <laughs> we also get to see the thunder ball of death. Is a uh, yeah, <laughs> like nuke level explosion insane i like the moment when he kind of disappears and they show him kind of like zap up into the cloud and like zip over to where the balls form when he's like let me show you something okay yeah no, that's what you're talking about yeah that is cool it's like when he disappears like he the yeah. first cuts him disappearing and then you kind of see like a line of lightning that shoots up the arc up the plume of smoke and then cuts across all the way to this like gap above uh Angel City, where he forms forms the ball. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Kind of cool, but also, and and then he's is he standing on top of it? Yeah, he's standing on top of it as it starts to like drop down. Yeah, just like the sheer like destructive power of Enderu is like something we haven't seen in the series so far. Yeah, yeah, this is a level of like it's killer finishing move. Like even even like like crocodile needed a bunch of other people and a bunch of specific things to do the things with the rain and the thing and the, and like the bomb. And even that, like he needed, he needed all of Broke's work, Broke works. Like in, uh, it, it took him years and years to set up this whole grand conspiracy. And was just like, all I need to do is go up in a big ship and just start lightning, 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 lightning. Like there was, <laughs> he didn't need to set this up beyond in any real set. Well, he needed to build the arc maximum and all that stuff. Yeah. But aside from that, like, like he didn't real like everything else kind of just felt like just killing time until he was done with the ship. And he was just like, and it, and it's just, it's, it's a level of just like, just how individually powerful he is. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. He, he's able to wipe out um, like Angel Island. Is now they're just like a massive like hole in the clouds like it's like unreal like just like how destructive this is so poor gone for yeah. just absolutely breaking down at the end there it's like what the hell i can't this is this is this is this is obscene even by your standards at early like... yeah because he he cares yeah. about the people of this island yeah. and just seeing like the destruction around him and like the people that he feels responsible for, like he, he's powerless to do anything. Like we can't even like comprehend how like cruel and like powerful Enru is. Yeah, it's a scale we haven't seen yet. You also Luffy, his argument of like I need them to understand. Like you could argue that like hey, you've got that giant golden arm thing. We've got if we can get all these other people out, we have a ton of witnesses dozens and dozens and hundreds of witnesses or whatever and other stuff and and uh, like we could it's probably enough to go down to cricket and be like yeah you were totally right here here's hundreds of witnesses of sky people and here's a giant gold ball on my arm and it's all probably good enough but he wants the exact specific thing he needs that we got to do that bell man he wants the bell we're doing the bell no matter what it takes <laughs> well i would i would argue that uh, well, just having a giant gold ball probably wouldn't be enough to be like, hey, like the gold existed in the sky. Like, like I mean, they could have the the gold elsewhere. I think it's a just lot like of the, gold. It's a lot of gold, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't inherently mean that it came from yeah, the sky. And then the other thing is, um, well, one thing is, are any is anybody gonna survive? All these people like in the sky might yeah. die right now. Yeah. And then are they feasibly gonna be able to get down from the sky? Like how do you get this many people down to the blue sea? So I think it's a tall order to expect uh, any witnesses to make it out of here alive. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you think Nami was just like didn't realize she never had a chance or something or uh, in what way? Like she's like we got to get out of here now. Like did she not realize there was zero chance of them getting out of here or if he doesn't kill if he doesn't defeat Anaru or something? Uh Nami is just thinking like we have to try to escape. Yeah. Like yeah. she she cuz she doesn't see it as a possibility like, we, we we can't beat this guy. Like she doesn't see any way of like, surviving except like let's just try to flee and like figure out the rest later. Like yeah, they just need to kind of get away from from here. I let me I'll, I'll clarify like Luffy's making the right choice, but I just I also I feel like he's making the right choice in the sense that he's he's the hero of the story and like I don't <laughs> like he has to exist in this way to function as that way. I don't know. It's it's he's he's got to be the that 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 force of plot I have to do this to 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 be the not I'm, i don't know it's it's sounding right but i what i'm just saying no, I, is like, I don't i think there was there could have been an argument uh at, to, to, uh, another way to do this it's not the right thing to do the right thing is what luffy is going to do like guaranteed it is he has to he has to deal with this guy but um i don't think nami was wrong to be like hey what the fuck we gotta go but that that's yeah. what makes luffy special as a character is because he's contrary to anybody else like nobody else in the right mind would do what Luffy's doing, but that's why Luffy is special. Like because his instincts are like I'm confident in my abilities. Like I'm gonna do what what I want to do. Whereas Nami, Nami's technically right here because like well we should have yeah, saved our lives. Yeah, right. <laughs> and anybody else would be doing the same thing. It's like we need to get out. Like this place is about to blow up. Luffy's like yeah I don't care about that right now. Like this is I'm gonna go to punch be. the bomb. <laughs> I gotta go ring the bell. <laughs> There's a bomb in the building. Well, I'm going to go punch the bomb. <laughs> and also yeah, ring Luffy, the bell. He just near wants the to ring the bell. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so like, even, if it, even if it costs Luffy his life, he's like, I need to ring this bell. I got to ring so, the bell. To, to Luffy, that's more important than like his, yeah. his life. And it's just so admirable because I feel like in these moments when you know Luffy makes up his mind, and we all know once he makes up his mind, there's like no changing that. Um, but a lot of times it's it's for motives outside of his own motives. Like a lot of times it's mm -hmm. for like right here he's he's fulfilling, um, he's like doing this for cricket more so than yeah. himself, right? You know? And like, um, we see that in, in previous arcs as well, like Alabasta doing it for VV and things like that. Like he ha has, um, he's often motivated by people and are are fulfilling these goals for other people, not specifically for himself. Yeah. He's very like self selfless in that way. Yeah. And I think Luffy is just like an emotionally intelligent character. Where he like he understands like people a lot and he typically knows what would be the right thing to do for, for people. Mm -hmm. Um so we've seen in the past, you know, like you said with Vivi or also with like Nami when he destroyed like Arlong Park. Like he yep. wanted to destroy it like for Nami, like because of what it symbolized. So those are the types of things that Luffy gets and the people that he's trying to reach, they get it as well. So Luffy is just good about trying to convey that. And that's what a lot, motivates him a lot of times is to to do those types of things that are going to speak to those people on that emotional level. Love it. Love it. I love that Nami parked her bike right on Luffy. Like not the first <laughs> time we've seen. We've seen that happen like three times in this, in this uh, arc so far. Maybe that's just how you park waivers. Like you just have to park Maybe. on somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Good to go. Okay. Now we get Ace's Great Search for Blackbeard Volume 20. A lone Navy man dives into the Inferno. A brave and courageous naval officer heroically jumps into the flames to try to save the day. If only there are more good Marines like this man. Oh, this wow. poor selfless soul. The ideal Marine. <laughs> what a man. Putting his life on the line for this top secret information to save the ship that's on fire. Surely nobody can survive this. No way. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get the uh, thrilling next part in the next volume. But for right now, let's finish off this volume with chapter 295, Giant Jack. As Luffy grabs onto the edge of the Arc Maxim, Enru casually kicks his hand off the ship. 
Andrew laughs as he says he will destroy the entire island and sends a bolt of lightning that knocks Luffy off of Giant Jack. Determined to ring the bell, Luffy tries to ride the waiver up the stock, but is sent flying off again by Andrew. Luffy needs to ring the bell so Cricket can hear it and realize that the gold is in the sky, not in the sea. Elsewhere, the citizens of Skypea are devastated upon learning that they can't leave as a section of clouds to escape has been destroyed. Back on the Ark, Andrew spots a glimmer in the distance and is able to find the golden bell for himself. Down below, a large leaf falls near the Straw Hat crew. They notice a message instructing them to cut down Giant Jack to the west. Now that Andrew has found what he is looking for, everyone notices an even larger mass of dark clouds forming in the sky. Realizing that if there's any hope of Luffy being able to stop Andrew in time, Naomi will have to help Luffy get there by steering the waiver. They put their faith in their friends and hope that they got the message as uh, they'll have one shot to make the jump off of Giant Jack. All right, so we are approaching uh, the climax here. And yeah, so they devise this plan. They're going to cut down Giant Jack and they're going to ride the waiver and try to launch Luffy uh, towards uh, Enderu and hopefully the Giant Bell. Putting all their eggs in one basket. <laughs> it's kind of all they can do at this point. <laughs> yeah, so it's a Hail Mary. <laughs> I love Zoro. Like, if he says he's gonna do it, he will. Like, there's no <laughs> yeah. stopping this. Like, there was no, yeah, there's right. no way out of this, y'all. Like, I, I understand this guy. I've been traveling with him for a fair bit yeah. at this point. <laughs> Got a bit of a one track mind. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he knows his captain. He trusts his captain. He, he's seen uh, Luffy uh, follow through enough times at this point. But it was uh, pretty smart of them to uh, drop the leaf down <laughs> to. Get yeah. a message down there. So, <laughs> instead of like, trying to go all the way down, try to like explain it. Like, we hope to get the leaf. <laughs> Look out! Something's falling. <laughs> God, that that big old spread of Enru like opening the sky and like the giant blast of the, of the kingdom come or whatever. Yeah. Catastrophic. You want to ring that golden bell, don't you? Yeah, I'm going to ring it. <laughs> <laughs> you better promise me you'll keep me alive. All right, leave it to me. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, so I like that Luffy needs Nami's help here because we see him try to steer the waiver and just be terrible at it. We see him like like earlier at yeah. the beginning of the arc too. How he just yeah, could not steer the waiver. You can't do so, it. So it's like he needs Nami's help because he, there's no way he's going to be able to get there without her. <laughs> <laughs> and I like uh, seeing Zoro at the end where like you see him start dashing towards the uh, towards Giant Jack. So like, they're our only hope. So he, he knows what he has to do. So hopefully, uh, he, he, hopefully he gets it right because he doesn't know directions. So. Yeah, he sure does. <laughs> right. <laughs> He actually turns. He accidentally turns around and cuts off Usopp's nose. There, I did it. <laughs> no, not that beanstalk. The other beanstalk. Chop down the beanstalk. <laughs> oh man. Building up to quite the finale. Yeah, some pretty crazy stuff here. Stakes are high. Stakes are perhaps higher than they've ever been. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, we do have um, Anuru, um find the golden bell. So. We have confirmation still up here. They were right. Pineglyph's there too. Yep, and we, you can see the pine glyph. <sighs> I wonder what it says. So, chopper. <laughs> someone chopper, can read it. <laughs> if only. <laughs> so, is it Chopper, Sanji, and Pierre? Are the three still unconscious? Probably. Uh, I believe so. It that way. It looks like Zoro grabbed Chopper during one of the explosions. Um, yeah. you see the gone for grabs it Pierre. Looks like Pierre, looks like, yeah, it looks like Pierre, Chopper, and Sanji are all out still. Oh, yeah, Usopp's carrying Sanji. <laughs> oh, it looks like Zoro throws Chopper to, to Robin. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hot potato. <laughs> hot potato. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> good 
stuff. And uh, I do love like the the first page where we see Luffy grabbing onto the edge of the arc maxim, and then just Andrew just like casually just like boop, just like yeah. <laughs> kicks his hand off, like not even like lifting a finger. And you're also ready for a fight. Like, let's go! We made it to the <laughs> ship. Nope. <laughs> not that easy. So the fun volume. Yeah, and gives us some some. Uh, much needed uh, context too for the, the history. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like I like that we get the the backstory. Um, it, it does kind of throw the the main story off a little bit, but I do think the context is really important as to why this golden bell is so important. So I really do you like that we get the full picture of Nolan mm-hmm. and what really happened. And he wasn't a liar, so like we we know the truth definitively that he was telling the truth. And we see that, like, what the circumstances were. So, yeah, I do like that uh, we get those details. And now we, the the stakes are, like, all like at an all-time high. And, like, Luffy's determination. Uh, I, I love seeing him like this, where, like, he's like, I'm going to do this thing, and I'm going to do it no matter what. Also, visually, this was a really cool volume. In fact, there was a lot of, like, really big panels. There was a couple, you know... Two two page uh, montages. Yeah. Uh, there was also two full like double page, um, just like random sketches. Or I don't know what they're called, like spreads, I guess. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun visually. I enjoyed it. Very much. It's very just grand and epic in a way that One Piece like. No, I mean they got pretty epic. They got very epic and like <laughs> like a much more grounded scale in 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 Alabasta and such. But this is an epic. This is epic as in like heavenly, like almost like the classical definition of it, like a godlike thing. Like mm-hmm. where, where if Alabasta was Game of Thrones, this is Lord of the Rings epic. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's a fair comparison. There's like a, like a higher power involved here. Yeah, in a sense. I feel, and I feel like we've gotten, you know, we got a lot of backstory throughout the series, but nothing like this. This was almost an entire volume, majority of a volume of just backstory, and not even like of the main characters that we're dealing with, right? Like I feel like we don't get that too often. So uh, I do think it's interesting, but that, that's why I I think having a series like this long benefits from being able to take the time to tell this kind of story and you can deviate a little bit from the main story and take the time to tell the story of other characters who aren't the main characters and you can like tell a full story that way too so yeah i I think that's one of the benefits of the series and i enjoy that we get to have this type of content here in the story totally yeah i definitely think it adds it adds to the arc for sure and it kind of just like builds up the people and their culture too i think in a cool way yeah He's become more familiar with the Shandians and Shandora and El Dorado. And Noland and yeah. Kagura too. Yeah, and then uh, it's all Lipper coming together. Like it. yeah. It's all coming together really <laughs> nicely. Okay. Uh, any other closing thoughts on the chapter or the volume as a whole? Bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> <laughs> let's get this let's get this done. <laughs> Come on. So close. <laughs> all right well that will conclude this week's episode of the we are reading one piece podcast you can find this episode wherever podcasts are found at we are reading one piece podcast.buzzsprout.com or on the youtube channel at we are reading one piece this is a spoiler free channel up to where we're, we have recorded the podcast so far so if you're new to the series you can visit the channel there you can also find me and this podcast on my youtube channel at pirate king codex for various one piece content Next episode, we'll be uh, next episode we'll be discussing volume thirty-two, love song. I've been Joel, and I've been joined by Sean. This is Sean Has and Sean. Evan. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Be sure to bring along all of your hopes and dreams, and we'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs>